dry flies go. So we're going to skip the tying just because it, it's just too small. And uh, I didn't want to take the time to do a big giant streamer session for something like this. Um, hey, there we go. YouTube's up and running. Good thing. So sorry, YouTube's been having a having an issue with the lives. Um, so welcome for you guys on YouTube and gals. Um, so we're not going to tie tonight. And the reason is this fly is just too small. It doesn't show up. I didn't want to take the time to do a whole streamer. Take quite a bit of time away from what we want to talk about, which is trout fishing. This fly, though, the Irish Rover is on YouTube. I will share it on our Facebook page as well so you can see it. It is a, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we're going to talk about it during the program. Um, it's killer fly, though. It's, uh, it's one I came up with, um, geez, I don't know, maybe 2012. And it's a, it's a really nice black stonefly pattern. Um, but I tie it in, in yellow to imitate little yellow sallies as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's a killer little stonefly. You know, they probably eat it as a caddis too if you tie it a little smaller, a little shorter. So let's get going on the, on the trout. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about trout fishing. Um, we're going to talk mainly about brown trout. And we're going to talk mainly about uh, two rivers that um, – well, one section of one river and another river that I don't talk too much about because they're kind of my babies. And they're places that I go with my family and uh, with uh, my kids. Um, and I go on my days off. Uh, somebody asked me today, you know, have you been steelhead fishing on your days off? And, and the answer is no. I don't do a whole lot of spring steelhead fishing on my own, to be honest with you. Um, if I have a day off this time of the year, I'm typically trout fishing um, or pike fishing or musky fishing. Uh, but trout, um, where we're going to talk about tonight are two of my favorite places in the world. And uh, one is the perfect trout classroom and is the, and the other is just a perfect trout fishery. So let's get started. I'll move us on over and, uh, and get going. Um, glad you're all here. Uh, don't forget tomorrow night for all you trout nuts, be a little nutty and come back for the long nose guards discussion. Uh, long nose gar, if you haven't tried it during that heat of the summer when the trout fishing's kind of slowed down, uh, long nose gar, a really good option for those of you that like to throw streamers, especially. Um, and they're, it's awesome. I'll show you some great videos and pictures tomorrow night on long nose gar. But let's get started on the trout. So. Sorry, you were a little late there, YouTube folks. I don't know what happened. We'll get you going now. All right. So obviously, if you have any questions, just jump on it. Yeah, uh, Robert, that's good. I don't know if you're on YouTube last night. YouTube just doesn't have a great connection for lives. Um, um, I don't know what the deal is with that, but their their connection for lives just isn't real good. So I'm glad that's better for you tonight. All right, here we go. Your nose, but in case you don't, my name's Dustin Harley, and I uh, own and operate and guide um, for Ripple Guide Service, and have since I started it in 1999. Been a lot of years. Um, time flies when you're having fun, especially fun with all my friends that I get to fish with. It's it's an awesome. It's cool. It's it's fun to fish the same folks year after year. Tonight, we're going to talk about trout. Um, basically, March to December, we can catch trout. If you had to, we could probably catch trout 12 months a year. Um, but the other months, I'm, I'm really, uh, you know, we're in February, I don't do much trout fishing. If I'm out, I'm typically uh, steelhead fishing that the time of the year. But, uh, but you could. Uh, these 12 months a year, catch trout around here. There's no question about it. Some streams are open year round. Oh, uh, you're all here because you love trout. Everyone here loves trout. Hopefully, no one here loves trout this much. We don't have very many rainbows, brook trout uh, streams that I. Uh, the Wajak River, I've caught two brook trout in my life. Um, Dwajak Creek, I've caught. Hey, Jack, how are you? Wajak Creek, I've caught uh, one rainbow in my life. So we're talking all browns for the most part tonight. 
Again, the majority of my guiding is done in this area right here. So Southwest Michigan or Northern Indiana, that's kind of my radius. Um, the streams we're gonna talk about tonight are in this area, a little smaller radius. Uh, both of these streams we're going to talk about, for the most part anyway, that we're going to talk about, are within about uh, no, 20 minutes of each other. Yeah, it was Lig Man, Eric. I love it. <laughs> All right, so two streams we're going to talk about. Dwajak River. This is above the dam. We're in the migratory trout section. Uh, this is the water that is above the dam. Um, now, very soon, there won't be a dam on the Dwajak. So we'll be talking, I guess, about the whole thing. But as of right now, the dam is still there, and the water we're talking about is above the dam. I will catch more trout in a day above the dam than I will for an entire year below the dam. And that's the truth. More fish in one day above the dam than I will in an many trout below the dam. The trout that are there are pretty big, but there aren't that many. And I'll show you a few here in a while, though, that are. And there are some big trout down there. Yeah, Gail there. Uh, he asked if the dam is still there. Yes, it's still there. Um, it's slated to be taken out this summer, but I don't know if this cold uh, shutdown is going to impact that at all. Well, I would assume that it will, but I have any word that it will for sure or not. But I would assume that it might. Maybe we're going to get another year out of it. We'll see. But as of right now, yes, it's still there. Above the dam is not real weightable. Unfortunately, um, it's deep. Um, it's mainly boat water. There are a few places you can jump in and wade. Uh, Dodd Park being one of those. Um, in the middle of the summer when it's super hot and you just want to go in a pair of shorts, you can go wade wherever. But if you're having to wear waders and you're worried about filling your waders, it's not a good idea to wade above the dam very often. Uh, in very it's just a, a much, much of that river uh, above Kinsey has, has been dredged, and, and it's a deep, deep dredged river. It's great fishing, but it's more of a boat river than it is a weightable river. It's just now we've got a couple of other. Uh, that Creek. It is, in my opinion, the trout classroom that you can have. And why I say it's very accessible, it's very weightable, it has great hatches, the insects are coming off at the times and in the places and at the times of the year um, there are a lot, lot of brown, brown trout in the Duwajak Creek however 15 inch trout in Duwajak Creek don't get me wrong but your average fish is going to be small but as far as to go and out and learn how to trout fish, especially dry fly fish, Dwajak Creek is, is about is both guided out in Montana for years and years over anything I ever fished in Montana to teach someone how to dry fly fish. Um, it is going to catch fish. All right, trout tackle stations in here. But a nine foot five weight is going to cover both of these streams. Um, you know, if I know we're going on Duwajak Creek, I'm probably not. But a nine foot five will cover us no matter what we're doing. 
feel to match. Again, for most people, what that means is you can throw the line in your back pocket and not have it on a reel. And for most trout that you'll catch in these streams, you get some really nice ones here in a little while. Uh, for that big fish, it is nice to have a drag system that will sustain and, and give you a nice smooth run of a fish, especially a big brown trout that does a lot of head shaking. You want a really smooth drag when they do that. Um, so what we go with are lampsons. Um, that's that's for throwing soft tackles. Um, that's all we need. Uh, if we're subsurface and throwing streamers, then we're um, – and then, again, we just pull three feet of straight monofilament. I don't worry. Use mono. I want that thing to get down, and uh, and that's the way to do it. There's enough power in these big flies and in the casts I'm going to show you that um, you're going to turn the fly being a tapered leader and thinking that you can't turn the fly over. You will turn the fly over. They're, the flies are big enough and the casts are powerful enough. You are going to turn the fly over. Um, and streamer fishing, for the most part, in these streams is going to give you your largest fish of the year. Um, so let's talk a little bit about technique. The cast. The cast of a streamer cast is, we talked about it the other night, all back casts. So we bring the back cast here. We lift on the forward cast, and we come over the top. So parallel back cast, we lift, and we come over the top. That does two things. Number one, it keeps the fly out of your head. Number two, which is the most important thing. Number two, it powers that cast to where we're turning the fly over and we're smacking and nothing soft and nothing delicate about streamer fishing. And I want that fly to smack down on the water as hard as I can get it to smack down. That does two things. Number one, it scares away the small fish that we're not wanting to catch anyway. Number two, it wakes up the big fish and now pick up those big fish. It's kind of like Somebody bangs in your door at 2 in the morning. You get up and you're not very happy about it. And that's the same way with those fish. So jerk strip. So here's the movement of the fly. What we're looking to do here is we are twitching the rod tip. We're jerking the rod tip and we're stripping, keeping a tight line. But it's very aggressive. And I'll show you some of these in the videos. I'll point these out. The next one is a strip stop. So we're now, now we're not moving the rod tip. We're pointing the rod tip straight at the fly. We're stri stripping. And then we are stopping. Okay, now we're talking about fish that maybe aren't as aggressive. Hey, they're not looking for an 18 inch movement. They're looking for a six to eight inch movement. So we're stripping and we're stopping. So the fly is doing this motion. A okay? little less, little less aggressive. Then we go to a quick twitch. And these are really the only three that I use. If they're not eating one of those three, we're probably in trouble for the day. But a quick twitch is this. It's just a quick short strip. Okay, you can use rod tip a little bit. Two. The thing about using rod tip, though, well, you come here, here with the rod tip, and as you go back, back, you've created slack. So I like to not use rod tip a whole lot in my movements of the flies. I'd rather, I'd rather use the motion of strip to move the fly. Because um, if you're using rod tip, you are creating some slack in, in that uh, quick Twitch. So I try not to use the rod tip much. Any slack I can get out of the line is a good thing. All right, type of water we're fishing, streamers. Um, well, dry flies too, for that matter, or mousing. What we've got here is submerged timber. A whole lot of turtles, obviously. We've got logs and we've got submerged timber. We've got heavy current out here, and this is a little slower current through here. This is what we're looking for. This is where those trout are going to lay. That's where they're hunting. All right, here we have a pretty uniform bank. Rocks, which we talked about with smallmouth. Rocks mean crayfish, 
They mean beat them. Yes, but what we have here is a pretty uniform bank. It looks really nondiscreet, like there's really nothing there. But what you can see right here is that bank drops off. And this, this is a bank that I have seen more big fish come out of than probably any bank I've ever fished. And it, most folks probably know you fishing. It doesn't look like anything. But right here, there's a drop off about a foot. Four feet drop, uh, four feet off the bank, it drops off. And if we can get the fly here and strip it off of that drop off, like I said, I see more big fish come off that bank than I have any other that I've ever guided on. All right, so a couple of techniques here. Um, typically, I like to keep my cast directly across the river, right here. But we got a little too close, so we're getting the cast down by the bank, down by the tree now. We've already hit all, all this. There's a log here that you can't see that kind of keeps us from going way over here so we can cast straight across. Um, we're going to end up over there, but it's going to be a little too late. We're going to spook this fish if we don't get the cast downstream. There's a little back eddy right there. So if you watch here. Right against the tree, jerk strip. So that's the jerk strip. Watch that again. Ultra aggressive fish, we're using the jerk strip. So I jerk the rod, I strip. I jerk and I strip. This is the upper douage. You can see it's kind of a dredged ditch up there. Um, it is a beautiful trout river bowl. I mean, you talk about some great fishing. Here we're just stripping. This is the upper project, but now we're getting down to the spots that aren't dredged. Now it's a gorgeous stream. Now we're just quick twitching. These are all fishy this time of the year. You can tell that's probably this week. I'd have to look back at the book, but that's probably April 20th or so. Um, it is a great, absolutely awesome streamer river. If you like the streamer fish, the upper D is, is a streamer fisherman's heaven. And we're right back to that animal, what we talked about last night for the, with the smallmouth. This is a great streamer series. Um, Russ Madden series of streamers. There are some great streamers out there. Uh, pick one you like. Learn how to fish it. I really don't feel like it's the fly most of the time. I feel like it's the angler and where you're fishing and the water you're fishing in. Uh, I feel like that's really what matters. Um, obviously, there are differences in flies and there are differences in favorite colors for times of the day and, and sky and clear water and dirty water. Um, but the reality is, pick a Pick a fly you like, tie it in four or five different colors. It's nonstop because you're not catching fish. Learn the water better. Um, I have got a, I've got a sticker on our old guide fridge that said, it's not the fly, you just suck. And, you know, to be honest with you, it's a little, little crap. But to be honest, it's, it's much about flies. And much about $700 fly rods and $700 rods and $120 fly lines and $700. We don't worry about what we really, um, it really doesn't. I can, uh, most people that can cast, they can take a $100 fly rod and make it do the same thing that a $700 fly rod can do. And that's put the fly in front of the fish. You may change your casting stroke. But we as fly fishermen worry way too much about equipment and not enough about being coming a better fly fisherman. Uh, Stan asking you to post the recipe for the animal. I don't put that one out there, buddy. Um, I got your email this morning, but I was more, I 
if I remember right, that was one you asked about. Um, but the, the the animal in my big streamers, I don't really put out there. It's funny, it's secretive as I was on the screen and it's on the, we get some natural reproduction as well, but they're stocked with a lot of browns. And these little baby brown trout patterns early in the season, especially, are really, really productive. The gallop sex dungeon, another great fly. What Kelly call that? Well, I think the correct, his term was tits up. I think they changed it to the politically correct bottoms up trout pattern. It is one that I carry and fish a lot. Uh, rust always fishes really well for me. It's a great color for me. But again, I tr truly feel like, let me back up. I truly feel like all these flies I'm going to, if you learn how to fish more, more efficiently and smarter, a little bit more like a trout, you'll catch more fish than changing flies constantly. And that doesn't matter whether that's gar or uh, gar an exception. I literally throw one fly for gar. But or, or trout, it, it's all the same. Become a better angler, run an angler with a better uh, fly box. It, it's just that, it's just the truth. All right. We talked a little bit about fishing. Do we have any dry fly fishing around? Yes, we've got a lot, lot of dry fly fishing around. Um, it is, it, both these streams are catches, as you can see there. A lot of midges. We get good caddis hatches, as you can see here. It's a lot of caddis. We get mayflies. We get hoppers and beetles and ants. That's what we end our season with, as far as dry fly fishing goes, and then and then we're right back into uh, streamers later in the fall. What we start with is the early black stone flies as far as dry fly fishing. Um, and the pattern I was going to show you tonight, but it was just YouTube, and that's the Irish Rover. And the black stone pattern, uh, flowing at cork. And I have put it up against four or five of the quote unquote best black stone fly patterns that there are. And this one outfishes it, outfishes all of those every single time. It is a really, really nice pattern. Um, and again, I'll put that on Facebook. It's already on YouTube. All right, I talk about. We have midges. That's early in the season. Uh, that's now and uh, through about mid-May. Um, we get an early black stonefly hatch, which is our earliest hatch. That's normally starts late, but is normally in March and goes typically until yeah, the beginning of April. Um, then we start um, blueing olives. We do get some blueing olives, not a ton. Um, we get mahoganies. Uh, we get brown drakes, which is a great hatch on these rivers. And we get hexes, which are another great hatch on these rivers. Uh, these rivers get sulfurs. They get white flies. I mean, they get pretty much trichos. They get pretty much all the mayflies you can, that you can ever want. Uh, caddis flies, absolutely. Caddis are already hatching in good numbers. Um, this week, hopefully opening day, this Saturday on Dwajak Creek is good. Looks like the weather is going to be nice for it. We'll get some caddis hatches in the evening. Um, but we get caddis hatches, we get midges, we get all we get all the good hatches, um, which keep us real busy until about mid June, and then we'll talk about mid June in a second. So here's what I want to talk about tonight, and that is. Not just that there are a lot of stoneflies. I want you to watch what these stoneflies are doing. Obviously, they're hoping not to get eaten, which isn't going to happen to this one right here. Um, or this one here, if you watch him. Stoneflies move. They aren't sitting still. Okay? They are moving in the water. Caddisflies, when they're on the water, they're moving. Unless it's a spent caddis, it is moving. Um, Emerging mayflies. How many of you, give me a thumbs up if it's happened to you. How many of you have been out fishing for trout? And you made a mend, and it's kind of quote unquote, if you read the books, it was a junkie mend, and the fly moved a little bit more than you wanted it to, and a 
fish ate it. How many of you give me a thumbs up there if that's happened to you? Why? The re reality is stoneflies, midges, caddisflies all move when they're on the water. Mayflies move when they're emerging. They are not just laying in the surface film, in the meniscus. They are moving. Their fly isn't necessarily a bad men. We give a lot to those flies. Um, the only flies really that I dead dream um, and every I'm giving us some movement. Mayfly duns and mayfly spinners. That's really about the only things I can think that I completely dead drift. Everything else is moving on the surface. It wants to get off of the water. It knows the water is not safe. It knows the air the swallows will get them. They want to get up in the weeds. So add a little movement. So what we do is we cast downstream, we give it a little twitch, and then we let it float again. So to, in order to do that, you make a check cast. So what you do is you're going to make the cast. This is your rod tip. You're going to make the cast. And as soon as you straighten out, pull back a little bit. That creates a little bit of slack on the water. And when we can get that little bit of slack on the water, now we've got some room to play. Now we can twitch that fly, and then we can let it float that slack out. And we can twitch that fly, and we can have a stonefly hatch or a midge hatch. I'm giving some, those are all stoneflies struggling to get off the river. And none of them floating delicately down the river like a mayfly done might. This was a big fish. I'll show you in a little bit. All right. I talked about up to about June 15th, we dry fly fish, which is true. After June 15th, most of our, our big hatches are done. The water is getting pretty warm in the middle of the day. And we even the fish streamers, it's getting pretty warm. So what we do from about June 15th until the fall is we mouse at night. Um, I don't have any mousing videos. Mouse patterns is we're casting down and across. Almost like we would if we were streamer fishing with steelhead. We cast down and across off of the bank. So that gets this gets this bubbling, this bubbling. And that's what we're looking for in mouse fish is a lot of commotion. Uh, we're not going to pop it as hard as we would for pike or muskie. Um, but we're probably not going to pop it as slowly as we would for smallmouth. We're going to move it somewhere in between. We, very much again, my still sit still when we're on the water. The bank, so we fish mice patterns a lot during the heat of the summer at night. Um, so each program we've done so far, we've ended with some, some of my favorite, uh, you know, stories, some of my favorite fish that remind me of some cool things. And this was a fish that ended that stonefly presentation there that i said it was a nice fish that was eating eating uh, stoneflies i had a guide's day off that day it was a saturday it was last april might have been late march i don't remember for sure um jake was guiding steelhead down below the dam i was fishing on my own above the dam for for uh trout had a banner day that day with the stonefly hatch it was just awesome and this 22 incher came up ate a stonefly on a three weight and ate me up but I ended up landing. So I send this tip picture here to Jake, who, again, Jake's guiding below the dam. And I'm thinking I've got the king fish for the day, right? So it wasn't a minute later, Jake sends me this. He says, oh, that's a cute little fish, but we just landed a 23-incher. I tried to argue that I caught mine on a dry fly and Rich nymphed his. I don't know who wins that argument. I do know this, though. If you want to find big brown trout, be on the river the day that Rich Premick from Cincinnati is on the river. Um, because this is a 23-inch fish last year. And this, this is a 23-and-a-half-inch fish that he got this year. Oh, pounds. Yeah, Jake, it broke my heart. I thought I was the big man for the day. I see you laughing at me. <laughs> this is another fish I love from last year. Um, this fish, not giant. I think it was right at 20. 
Um, but here's the deal with this fish. We had this fish eat three different days in a row. We couldn't get it poked. I rode the boat way back upstream, kind of sat around for a bit to let it chill out, came back through. The thing ate right against the boat. We missed it. Probably never felt the hook. It probably ate it sideways. And back in, and it ate it again right beside the boat. You talk about an aggressive, hungry trout that wasn't leaving its spot. That's the one right there. This fish taught me a But I literally think, ooh, there's a good one. Well, guess where he caught it? Right there. Literally right where I had just walked, not even two minutes earlier is this and I can prove this to you on the river so many times we are sometimes uh, takes another cast and literally right right where that fish was jumping and jumping and jumping he hooks and lands it um, sometimes we give them too much credit I remember a fish one time that we uh, motored over a hole and never fished that hole. And I literally just motored over it. We dropped the anchor. And this was back in the days I fished the drift boat on the Joe. So I dropped 90 pound chain, which is the loudest thing ever, straight to the bottom of the river, slowing it down. It crashes to the bottom of the river. I make a cast literally right where I just dropped the anchor chain. I make a cast and I hook off one time on the yellow. My dad and I were small, we were pike fishing. Um, threw up in a tree, and I we go over to get it. I reach up, I grab the fly. Never reach up to grab a fly out of a tree. You never look up. For some reason, I did. I don't know why. Maybe it was tangled a little harder than I thought. I literally fell down. Big crash. Bam. Boom. About flip my dad out of the boat. So we row back out, and I throw a cast right back where I just fallen out of anger, really. And I catch an 18 inch smallmouth. Again, sometimes I think we give these fish just too much credit. I mean, we do. Doesn't mean you can't be stealthy. Um, I remember one day we were fishing on a local creek, a uh, really small stream, and uh, we were fishing the brown dray catch. And we kind of walked in real slowly and then got on our hands and knees. And we were talking a stream that's about as I don't know, maybe uh, it's probably 20 feet wide, maybe. Um, that might even be a little too wide, probably more like 15 feet wide. And I, we crawl in on our hands and knees, get right to the edge of the bank, and we're kind of part the trees and the, and the reeds and the weeds, and we're looking through, and the fish are eating, and we're just sitting there watching them. And the guy that I was with starts whispering. and I said, why are you whispering? He goes, I don't want to spook any fish. And I yell at the top of my lungs, they can't hear us. And these fish that are two feet away still just keep munching away on the, on the mayflies and the brown drakes. Sometimes I do feel like we give them a little too much credit. I remember on our very first website and uh, on our confirmation letters we'd send out in 1999, it said, uh, wear a build hat. And then in parentheses it said, not white. And I was so worried that fish would see that color white. Again, I don't think any of those things are bad. I mean, hey, any advantage we can get over a fish is a good advantage. I don't think that waiting in here before your buddy casts like I did is probably going to work every time. But it worked that time. And it works so often um, when we're fishing these fish. I mean, it just, I don't have a whole lot more for you tonight. Unless you have a bunch of questions, which I'm hoping you do. Uh, like I said, for the most part, what we're looking for in, in these streams is we're looking for not, we're, it's not Montana, right? In, on any of the streams around here. Um, it's not Montana. However, I will say this. My largest fish every year I died in Montana, except for one year, came here, not in Montana. The only exception to that year was one year where we got a 26 and a half inch cutthroat during the salmon fly hatch. Um, 
Yeah, Jake, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Jake says, unless you're fishing Poindexter Slough, then you'd better dress like a ninja. Look, there are places where fish are really smart. Um, Poindexter Slough, if you're not familiar with it, is a public spring creek. And I have never in my life fished a stream that, that fishes harder and tougher and, and smarter and more difficult than Poindexter Slough. That place, any advantage you can get is a good advantage. Uh, that is for sure. Um, but other than one 26 and a half inch cutthroat that we got on the Yellowstone, um, I think that would have been 2001. Every other year I guided in uh, Montana, my biggest trout came here, not in Montana. And I'm not talking steelhead. I'm talking brown trout. We have a lot of big browns around here, um, but you're not going to go out and catch, you know, 15, 18 inch fish. Um, you might go out and catch a few 18 inch fish, but it's not going to be dozens. It's not the Missouri. But I say it all the time and I'll say it again tonight. I will take the fishing we have in this area over the fishing that we have in Montana any time. Um, the reason is this, and it's variety. In Montana, I can't talk about the species I've talked about. Uh, we can't talk about the numbers of species we talked about so far. We've got another night yet. Um, the variety of species we have around here within an hour of South Bend is absolutely not found anywhere else. Um, the Great Lakes region is, is, is just great. I mean, it just is. I can go out any month of the year, a mile from my house, and catch trophy fish, whether that be salmon or steelhead or pike, um, smallmouth, trout. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable. Long nose gar. We can go out any month of the year and catch fish a mile from my house. Um, there are very few places in the country that can say that. Uh, there really are, in freshwater anyway. We're lucky. We're lucky around here. Uh, we really are. Um, a little trout stream. It is the best trout classroom I've ever seen. Uh, if you've got a beginner you want to introduce to trout fishing or if you want to inter get introduced to trout fishing, I would love to take you up there and show it to you. Um, the Wajak River is my favorite. Uh, I prefer that because the fish are a little bigger and there, there are fewer people. Um, again, Dwajak River, where I'm trout fishing, isn't relatable. That's the only negative with it. Um, but as far as trout fishing goes, I prefer it over Dwajak Creek. But I've already been to trout school. And if you really want to learn how to trout fish, Dwajak Creek is it. I really think it is. I think it's the perfect trout classroom. Oh, any questions? Yeah, Jake says they're very humble, humbling. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, um, Poindexter Slough trout, man, they will kick your butt. Anybody ever fished Poindexter Slough on here? Those fish are unbelievable. They really are. That is a tough, tough place to fish. Jake, I was, the year that I met you in Montana, I had just fished Poindexter Slough and probably got my butt kicked, um, I would imagine. Normally, I did get my butt kicked on Poindexter. I mean, if you got there really early in the morning and you found some good, you know, good uh, trico hatch, you could catch some fish. But, man, it was tough. All right. There were a couple of questions. Let me go back up there. Justin says, a little off topic. Does the name of your guide service have anything to do with the dead song Ripple? Justin, it has everything to do with the song Ripple. So I don't normally do this, buddy, but we'll do it. Let's see if you, yeah, if you want to hear some great stories about that song, uh, give me a call and I'll tell you, uh-oh, hold on. And uh, that was a cool, that was a cool night. Um, yeah, absolutely. Tyler asked, I was trout fishing and found a good spot to wade. Doing high stick nymphing, dead drifting technique. He showed me about five minutes later, I noticed about 12 rainbow trout. In that same spot, every time I got my nymph by them, they'd swim up, look at it, and not eat it. Switch to a different pattern. Yeah, I mean, if they're really swimming up and looking at your fly, then you might have a fly issue. But the first thing I would change is I would drop down tippet size. Um, I don't know what tippet you're using, but if if you're getting fish attention and they're not eating and you can see that, uh, that's probably what I would do is I would change flies. But first, I'd probably anyway. 
So that's that's what I would do. Um, let's see what was the other. There was another question. Do you ever fish the saw tackle dropper under your drives? So Jeff, no, I don't very often. Um, I fish a lot of soft tackles. Uh, we didn't talk too much about soft tackles in that, and I should have talked more about soft tackles because I do fish a ton of soft. Um, I don't use – so, yeah, Tyler, depending on what type of water you're fishing, maybe drop down. I mean, 5X nymphing, that's pretty small. So I would have probably – I would have probably grabbed, you know, just another fly because 5X tippet nymphing, that's fairly small already, especially this time of the year because – to me, a saw tackle is a great imitation of a, an emerging caddis. And when I see fish eating emerging caddis, uh, that's my go-to fly. And even when I don't see them eating it, emerging caddis, unless there's a hatch going on this time of the year, I'm doing one of two things, saw tackles or I'm fishing streamers. Um, I typically fish. So, yeah, I fish soft tackles a lot um, this time of the year especially but not typically as a dropper on a dry. I don't normally use dries as surf trout. Here uh, in this area, it's not, it's not a tractor. I'm not searching with it. I'm finding a fish that's rising and we're casting to a, an individual fish or a pod of, you know, of individual fish. Um, if I'm searching for fish, uh, then I'll throw streamers in slower water and then I'll, and, and soft tackles in, uh, in the faster um, riffles. But I'm not typically throwing dry flies to kind of try to find fish. Normally I've got fish picked out that are actively rising when I'm throwing dries. So no, I don't do that. Yeah, jumping, Eric says jumping. Why did I, why did you start guiding in 1999? Um, that's when I graduated college. So, as soon as I graduated college, I started guiding. Um, my soccer coach wouldn't let me out of my scholarship. No, I'm joking. Uh, I, I, I guided a little bit in 98, actually, the fall of 98. Um, I guided a little bit um, in that in Sam in that fall. And actually, my very first guide trip was uh, Pike that summer of 98. But I didn't, didn't go full time until 99. But my my first uh, my very first guide trip ever um, that I was paid for um, that was that was uh, pike on the yellow yeah, with conventional tackle back then yeah we see way more pike now on flies than we ever, ever did on conventional tackle it's not even close so yeah Dan that's why I started guiding in '99 I finally graduated college uh, I was on the uh, eight year program. Oh, fishing will do that to you. Oh, hey Art, how are you? Good to see you joining us, man. Any questions? Um, now, like I said, I love getting texts and calls. And uh, okay, Tom, uh, float the Dwajak River. So above the dam? No, you cannot put a drift boat above the dam. Um, Canoe, yeah, yeah, you can put a canoe. The issue with the canoe is this. Um, there are oftentimes a lot of log jams, and I worry about you getting halfway up a log and then tipping or sideways into a log. Uh, the upper Dwajak is, like I said, it's narrow, and it's been dredged, and the banks aren't real stable. So there are a lot of logs in that river. A lot of a lot of big nasty log jams. A drift boat, though, no, not a chance. There's nowhere to put a drift boat in or take a drift boat out. Um, so yeah, the lower Dwajak you can do a drift boat, but not the upper. So yeah, like I said, if you guys any questions, whether anything that we talked about, the smallies or pike or musky, or I love answering questions. I, I you know, to me, I spent a lot of time on the water. Um, I spent a lot of time in college because I was on the water. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time fishing. And uh, if there's anything I can help anybody with, whether you ever use me as a guide or not, um, no big deal to me. Give me a call. And I always tell people, you know, Thursday night we're going to do a discussion about gear. And we're going to talk about all the little things that we use, whether it's rods, reels, or you know, different vices and all the things that we use and um, the things that we use, we use a lot. 
and we've used a lot of different uh, brands and a lot of different lines inside of those brands. And uh, I don't make any money off of anything that I that I recommend. So I'm always going to give you the straight shot. And I'm not saying fly shops won't give you the straight shot, but uh, they do sometimes have a, you know, they're, they're sweet a little bit sometimes. I'm not. So I'm going to give you the honest truth. Um, why, what float, what boat do I normally float the upper? Uh, I use a raft. Yeah. Um, I've got a, uh, I've got a raft that I use. We used to have a small little tiny boat that we, um, but it got awfully heavy to pick up over the log jams as I got older and bad shoulders and bad knees from soccer. Um, so yeah, I use a raft up there and some sections are not floatable. Uh, there are sections that I cannot float doesn't matter how much I if, you know, would love to, um, I can't float them. There are some sections that just, they have log, log jams as big as my stinking house. Um, I don't mind cutting a tree now and again to get something down, but literally uh, some of the log jams on some of the sections, you'd need dynamite. So there are some sections I just, I, you can't float it in my raft. You can't float it in anything. But when I do float up there, um, it's in a raft. Yeah, it's in a Smith flock, and he makes great rafts. So that's Thursday night. It's kind of that gear um, gear night. So come prepared for questions uh, that I doubt that we haven't used. And I'm going to be 100% honest on all those questions, and I'm hoping I don't step on anybody's toes. But there are some things I love, and there are some things I absolutely do not love. And I, like I said, I don't make money from anybody uh, when it comes to gear, so I will tell you the straight. It's got a lot of money. Money. when I was first starting out in this thing on stuff I should never spent money on. I've got, so, I had, I sold a ton of rods a few years ago, but I had so many rods out in my garage that I, they were junk. Um, I, I remember I had one Winston that was, I don't know exactly what it was because he knows. Um, it, you know, there are some things out there that I, I just don't care for. Uh, um, they don't work for the amount of money you're spending. They just aren't worth that amount of money. Um, and there are other things that are that work better and will save you some money. So we'll we'll go through all that stuff. And I promise you, I'm not going to be worried about stepping on any company's toes. We'll let you know what we think about it, because that's what I'm here for is pass on my knowledge. And uh, Jake and I both made a lot of mistakes in buying things that we thought were going to be great and that ended up not being great. And we'll we'll let you know what those were. So um, then the things that we love, we'll let you know what those are too, because there are a lot of brands that we use and a lot of lines and those brands that we use that are, they're phenomenal. They're great things to spend your money on. Any questions about tonight? Again, tomorrow's uh, Gar and then Thursday we'll wrap it this weekend. Dwajak Creek's waiting for you. Um, only the, only the uh, non-law abiding locals have been for you. So go hit it. Uh, it's a, like I said, Dwajak Creek's a super trout fishery, great trout classroom. Um, soft tackles throughout the day, uh, caddis in the evening. That's kind of your opening day. Uh, you know, two flies. You're going to take two flies to Dwajak Creek on Saturday. And it's a uh, little orange and black ribbed soft tackle throughout the rest of the day. Uh, did you say Dodd Park was weightable? Yeah, Robert, Dodd Park is weightable. Um, there's a couple spots there you got to be a little careful of, but for the most part, it's weightable. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about Dodd Park is this, um, and where they put in a uh, meander. So, again, most of the water above the dam has been dredged, uh, but they literally built, rebuilt, I should say. Uh, they rebuilt a section in Dodd Park, uh, and they connected that um so they basically put the river back where it was supposed to be. Uh, I have not caught a big fish in Dodd Park since they did that. And uh, I outside of that section on either side, upstream and downstream, but through the park itself, I haven't caught a big fish in there since they put the meander back in. Um, it's pretty river. It looks really nice. And it holds a lot of trout uh, since they put the meander back in, but it is weightable. Oh, any other questions? Hopefully you're getting out 
tying some flies, getting out fishing. I know I got a bunch of emails this morning. I'll just steal that. But um, if you know, if you have any questions, shoot them to me. Don't hesitate to ask anything. I'll I'll get them answered however best I can. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope I saw one here. William asks, Slump Buster is productive as far as streamers, particularly olive color. So we talked a little bit about as far as, uh, you know, different streamers and that I don't really feel like this the fly makes a whole lot of difference. Color does, though. But here's what I would recommend if you're looking for, let's say, three Slump Busters in olive. One would be a ticky fly that's an inch and a half to two inches. Uh, then I would have an articulated fly that's a little larger. And then I would have an articulated fly that's a little larger than that. I don't think the pattern really makes that big of a difference. I really don't. You know, again, I say that I carry, I don't know how many trout streamers, different patterns. Gosh, probably in my box, I have 30 different streamers and each one of them is probably in three or four different colors but i really don't feel like most of the time the pattern makes that big ah man jake i you know it's it's i talk about that a little bit in that video and i meant to mention that and jake hit it on the head jake said take the time to study the water and approach it with a purpose don't run and man is that the truth um you know, so many folks jump into a trout stream and, and spook the fish that they could have caught, which is standing, which is sitting in the water that they just stepped into. And if you watch the water, like Jake said, you sit and fish, whether they're eating or whether they're just laying behind a log that you would have never seen just running down a river, flailing away and, and uh, casting it on flying fish in in michigan or indiana keep the fly in the water but when it comes to trout it is best to sit on that bank for a little bit before you jump in or when you turn a corner on a trout stream hit the pause button for a second full i there's a section on dewajak creek that comes to my mind and it's a 90 degree bend and you come around the bend 